baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. 16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Presence, power in this building. Well, I don't know what's going to happen tonight, but the Lord told me, he said, pay attention to me and do what I tell you to do and don't worry about the results and don't worry about what anybody thinks about you. So I don't know what that means, but we're going to find out here in just a few minutes exactly what that means tonight. What a great, what a great, what a great crowd on Saturday night right here in the house of God. Let's give the Lord another hand clap for everybody showing up on a Saturday night. You may be seated. Praise God. Sunday night, I'm standing there worshiping God, and the Lord spoke to me and said, Sunday night. Tell my people that if they really want to be used by me in these last days in the supernatural and the gifts of the Spirit to show up Sunday night expecting me to release upon them the nine gifts of the Spirit so that they can walk in the Holy Ghost and be used to God. We got to get out of this thing where we're worried about who's going to get what and, and you know, if we're going to fail or mess up. If you're sincere and your heart is sincere, you always check yourself. You always want to make sure that you're exactly in the Lord. And uh, the Lord doesn't hold that against you as doubt. God always gives me a confirmation. I don't just fly off the handle. Uh, but whatever God speaks to me, I, I'm ready to obey it. And God gives me a confirmation. And, and I go forward and I believe God. And Sunday night, I'll be laying hands on, uh, I'm not going to say everybody, but it could be everybody. I'm going to be laying hands on, on people Sunday night. God's going to be releasing the uh, gifts of the Spirit in the measure that you're walking in. What people never hear taught is that whatever gift you have operates on the level of your obedience and your prayers and your yielding to God. One week. You could be really seeking God and walking in the supernatural and loving God, and your gifts will be just totally at an elevated area. But you start slacking up, letting up. You're still saved, but, and you're going to church, but the level of your abilities change. Everything moves in the degree of your consecration to God. And that's where a lot of these modern churches today that uh, call themselves Pentecost uh, have large numbers of people but the people just between services, they're not, you know, they're just not uh, loving the Lord like they need to, walking with God and seeking the face of God, trying to live a holy life and, and uh, trying to do what God wants. And, you know, they have a great band. They have a great sound. They have a great gathering. I preach in some of the churches, and believe it, I have to work so desperately hard to get miracles to happen in those congregations. The level of of God's operation in my life rises and falls with my daily faith and my daily obedience. I can go out and uh, sin and sneak around, and, uh, but it'll show up. You know, you may not see it, but I, I'll know it, and the devil knows it, and God will know it. And uh, so I've, I've got to try my best to live my life for the Lord. I want to do that anyway, not just so I can preach or I can pray for people and get miracles. You know, I, I want to do that because I love the Lord. This is a daily walk, isn't it? Everybody say, not a Sunday walk, but it's a daily walk with God. And uh, it, there's joy in that. There's happiness in that. But Sunday night, uh, if you really want God to really use you, then you go get you some olive oil. And you come to church Sunday night, bring some olive oil. I'm going to tell you what to do with that. I'm going to be uh, anointing and praying over uh, uh, people's olive oil uh, Sunday night, God's going to use you. I, I got several prophetic words from God that God's going to uh, do things for people on Sunday night. Now, don't freak out. Don't get sidetracked because you've never heard it before. Nobody's ever said this before. If you have lost loved ones that are sick or lost loved ones uh, that they're not saved and uh, they need miracles from God, if you will bring a picture of them 
or if you will have a picture on your uh, phone, your iPhone, Sunday night we'll be anointing uh, pictures of your loved ones and decreeing and declaring miracles over them. We'll point them out. I'm going to preach something. It'll make all the sense in the world, I promise you. It'll be biblical. I'll show you why God's telling us to do this. If you have any kind of needs outside the service, uh, outside the church that can't come to church, if you want to see people healed, you want to see people uh, delivered, then bring handkerchiefs with you Sunday night, and we'll be anointing those handkerchiefs. You can bring four or five. You can bring whatever you want to bring. And, uh, and the Lord, we're going to be anointing them, and God's going to be doing miracles the rest of this year from things that's going to happen on Sunday night here in this church. If you want to operate in the highest levels of faith, be here Sunday night. If you have a minister friend that is a, a, a in ministry and they're not in church on Sunday night, you tell them to come here that God's going to anoint their ministry and God's going to start using them in great and powerful ways in these last days. One of the, if not the greatest men I have ever met in my entire life uh, was a man that spoke to me about dreams and visions that he had. Uh, his name was T.W. Barnes and he told me of dreams and visions he named in uh, uh, 1999, he named the seven men that God was using uh, in, in, a, in a great, powerful way. And, and he named every one of them. I knew who they were. And, and, but he said, he said, but we will see the day that a hundred men will be used in the gifts of the spirit, the supernatural. And he said, the only churches that will be experiencing explosion and revival are those who walk in the supernatural and believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Listen, you don't have to worry about somebody in our churches getting carnal and trying to pretend they're in the gifts. There's enough wet blankets in our churches to put out any fire that's not of God. Trust me, there's enough skepticism and doubt and unbelief. I mean, I face it every service. I just ignore it because the devil hates you to ignore him more than anything in the world. If you're married more than two or three years, you, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, we're not definitely not calling our wives devils because that's also what I'm going to tell you what happened. And, uh, and I'm fearful Sister Winslow might be watching this. And, uh, but when you, your wife starts getting quiet, and she says, nothing's wrong with her. And she's not talking to you. There's something wrong. And it's real major when she won't tell you what it is. Go ahead and confess to every crime from A to Z and, and just repent and bawl and squall. And she might let you in that bedroom. And, uh, but if not, the couch. That's why when you go, always go with your wife to buy the sofa. And uh, lay on it a little bit before you buy it. Check it out just in case you may have to sleep on that sofa a few nights during the coming years. God's going to do great things in this service. God showed me this service. Uh, today, this afternoon, I was taking a nap and uh, just trying to kind of doze a little bit. And uh, I had a dream about this service, and God spoke to me about this service and showed me exactly what I'm supposed to do in this service and how he's going to work in this place. So we're going to get right in line with God and try to do everything that God wants us to do. How many believe we ought to do that? Yes. Real quickly, I'm going to give you something before we start preaching. The seven battles that everyone must win. Uh, the last, uh, not the last three revivals, but several revivals, God has spoke to me about these seven things. I believe, Brother Tom, I think I spoke about them last week. And the seven battles everyone must win, the battle of your faith, the battle for your money, the battle for your mind, the battle for your family. We're going to take care of that Sunday night. The battle of your integrity and the battle of your love. And number seven, the battle of your ministry. The battle of your faith. You have to always make sure that you're putting something into your faith that feeds your faith and makes your faith strong. You have to learn how to starve your doubts and not give your doubts any strength. There's one thing that God gives us permission to do, doubt our doubts. I quit doubting my faith and started doubting my doubts and my faith has become stronger by doing it. And so you have to feed your faith, you have to protect your faith. You never tell a doubter a dream that God has given you. 
You never tell a doubter a commandment God spoke to you about. You never tell a doubter something that the voice of God spoke to you because they will ridicule it. They will doubt it. They will talk behind your back about it. They will sabotage your faith and do everything they can to stop it. There's some people I don't talk gifts of the spirit or faith or anything of that nature. One night after a great service we were in, several preachers were in that service visiting from the surrounding areas. And one man had come there, and he's a good man, and, but he came there and he just did not believe in the gifts of the Spirit. He believed in miracles, but he believed in the kind of miracles where you beg and one out of a hundred gets it. That you put oil on people's head, but don't really expect anything to really happen. But to believe that you could actually on purposely speak something that you need and to have faith and speak to your mountain, didn't believe in it. I didn't know him, but God spoke to me during the service while I was preaching and told me to ignore him. And uh, that I would sense and feel great insecurity and great doubt in his mind and spirit. So after church, we go out to eat and all the ministry are asking questions about the supernatural. And how, how does God work and how does God operate? We'll be talking about some of that Sunday night. We can't, re, we can't pray for you to be used of God without giving a little bit of instruction about the gifts of the Spirit. You'll hear things Sunday night you never heard about the gifts of the Spirit. And, uh, and so, you know, I didn't let it bother me. I knew exactly where he was coming from. I watched him during those, that meal and he was just trying to find the right time and the right place to say something negative. I didn't take it personal. And uh, so all of a sudden he says to me, well, if you come to our church, you will not prophesy good things to everybody. He said, you will find the sin that's in the church hidden and you will dig it up and you will bring fear on everybody. And I said, well, I'm going to start with you. You'll be the first one. And he looked at me and he said, I don't have any, and he got the S out, but he didn't get the I N out because at least he had enough sense to recognize he was not perfect. And that if he had not committed some sins, it was because of the grace of God that was upon him and that was keeping him. And so he shut his mouth and zipped it up. I did not say that to put him on the defense. I didn't say that to even shut him up. I said it because it's the truth. If he wanted it dug out of the church, then it has to start in the highest place. Your sin and your repentance is a personal thing between you and God. We are not priests. We are preachers. And we don't have a confessional booth that you come into and that you confess. If you think it'll help you, if you want help from the man of God to give you uh, uh, strength and to help you, if you want to uh, show yourself to the man of God that you want to do what's right, that's different in explaining where your weakness is, what you're battling. But we don't set up booths in the house of God and you don't come to us and we don't go looking for your sins. We preach the cross, the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness and remission of sins, water baptism in the name of Jesus, for the removal of all sins, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost to keep you from sin. And that's what we believe and that's what we preach. He said, well, I heard of a preacher that could tell people their sins. You can illegally do a lot of things. I could tell you tonight that God wanted me to do this or do that. And, and maybe God didn't tell me. If he didn't tell me, that didn't mean God was going to back that. I've been asked to preach in denominal churches. I don't make a habit of it. I pray about it. I preach whatever God gives me. And I tell them that. I tell them I will not come in and try to create problems. But I'm going to preach whatever God gives me, whatever that might be. But I'm not going to come in and I'm not going to cause trouble and I'm not going to come in and just try to persuade everybody to believe what I'm, I, I believe. But I'm going to be honest. I'm going to preach. And I've heard them get up 
and talk about God's love. And I felt the anointing. But I've heard them talk about Trinity. Three co-equal gods never felt a thing. Uh, preach about once saved, always saved. Never felt one ounce of the anointing of God. God will not anoint a lie. He will not stand behind a preacher that is not preaching what the Word of God says. So we have to preach the Word of God. I have to preach tonight what God gives me. I have, uh, and I bring them with me, you know, wherever I go. I have several messages God has spoke to me, and I've written them down, and never, I've never preached them yet. I will preach them one day. The ones I don't preach are for me. And, uh, but I have to preach whatever God gives me. It has to be God's way. If we could just get back to that, to letting God be the God of the church, the God of our pocketbook, I, I, I would not even begin to tell you of the miracles that God has done for me in my life in the simplicity of my faith and the battle of my faith and believing God. But these seven great things are things you should memorize and write them down and put them someplace you can see them and say to yourself, I will never let anyone or any circumstance affect my faith. I don't let when God's going to do the miracle affect my faith. I'm not going to, I don't let if God's going to do it affect my faith. I don't let someone's opinion of me affect my faith. When I walk in this building or in any church and I get behind the pulpit, I'm going to do what God asked me to do. No matter who likes it or doesn't like it, I'm going to be as honest and sincere and truthful about everything that I could possibly be because I have to battle for my faith. There are demons and spirits that want to destroy the faith of the church. There's never been so much of a re revealing of the Antichrist like we've been seeing the last few years. And the things, and the devil's not going to stop. He's not going to stop with late uh, term uh, pregnancy. There's going to be a time that people are going to start pushing. Uh, the annihilation of the elderly and the sick. And uh, they'll call it mercy killings, just like they call abortion, uh, Christianity, and the love of God. Can you believe we've actually hear people say in the media that it is Christian to take the life of an unborn child? Can you believe that? They're actually saying that. Uh, 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 one of our ex-presidents and his family, I won't even mention their names, uh, mentioned that it was Christian to take the life of a child. How many preachers have been aborted? How many missionaries have been aborted? How many people that one day would have uh, uh, discovered a cure for a disease or a sickness? How many generations? When you take one life, you don't just take that one life, but you take every life that would have been born in the future of that child. What right does any of us have to touch what belongs to God? I, I, I don't even know why I'm on this tonight, and it's not something that I talk about very much. And uh, in liberal California, it's probably not the best place to talk about things like this. But it's in my heart, it's in my spirit. And, uh, you know, and if you're in this church and something, you know someone or, and they've done that, you, you know what, we, we don't judge people. We don't hold their past against them. God forgives you. You let it go, and don't you let the devil use it on you. I'm serious. Uh, this church is about forgiveness. And there has to be that. It has to be an abundance of forgiveness. I'd rather over forgive than under forgive anything or anyone. Right? Show forgiveness. Show forgiveness to visitors and guests and, and people. I mean, last night was a demonstration of the great power of forgiveness in the service last night. You just don't realize the kind of battles that were won last night in that service last night. It, it was unbelievable. The battle of your faith. Turn to somebody and say, I'm going to let my faith live. Tell somebody, no one's taking my faith. Number two, the battle of your money. 
Uh, when God speaks to you, when the man of God asks for something, it's in your power to do it, then you battle for your, your future blessing will never be sufficient enough in your own power. You're going to have to have the help of the Almighty God uh, in your home, your house, and, and your uh, everyday keeping up of your household. And in your future, you're going to need the finances of God and the miracles of God. And that's how you battle for your money. Number three, your mind. Do not let things get in your mind that don't belong there. Uh, have a door to your mind. Have a guard at your door. And don't let things get in your mind. Don't contemplate things that are going to defeat you. Number four, your family. Find the strength to believe God for your family. And never give up. If you have to take a two-week hiatus and, and not think about them for two weeks because they're just not doing what you're praying. Do what you have to do, but get back in the fight and stand there for your family and intercede for them. Your integrity weighs heavy with God. When no one would know, when no one sees you, when no one's around you, the weight of your character weighs very powerfully with God when he knows you could do it and get away with it. But you don't do it. Number six, your love. If you're a Democrat, love a Republican. If you're a Republican, love a Democrat. Oh my God. Some of you are going, oh, ouch. I know there's some real ornery, ornery ones that are just, man, they just love to argue like crazy. And, uh, but, you know, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. I had a neighbor one time years ago. I moved in the neighborhood. I had two bird dogs. and At that time, I had four kids. And the first time I met him, he said, there's two things I hate, dogs and kids. That's what he told me. Three months of putting up with all kinds of nastiness from him. One day, my wife comes in crying. I'm studying the Word of God. He comes in, or she comes in, she's crying. She don't want to tell me. Finally, she told me. I walked out the back door, looked over, there he was, motioned for him to come to the fence, grabbed him by the collar of his shirt, and I said, I'm, I'm going to punch you. And I said, when I do, I'm going to feel real bad, and I'm going to ask God to forgive me, and he's going to forgive me. And then I'm going to feel good again. <laughs> and uh, he said, you mean that? I said, yes, I do. Can you believe that? I mean, that should never be, that should not be the answer to anything. And he became so nice after that. His wife later told my wife, I knew the guy was a preacher. I could get away with anything. Well, that wasn't right what I did. It was not right. But I'm glad that God's a forgiving God, Right? And that he does forgive. And anyway, all I was guilty of was grabbing his shirt. I didn't actually punch him. But I really wanted to. Hallelujah. I was trying to figure what would be worse, cuss him out and ask God to forgive me or actually whip him. And I figured punching would be better than cussing. But I didn't either one. And I've grown a lot since then. Don't get on my dogs and don't get on my kids tonight. Integrity. Your love. Number seven, your ministry. I'm going to say this tonight, and I mean it. Everybody in this building has a ministry. Everybody. The Bible talks about the ministry of saints. I heard a man in 1973 preach the ministry of saints. In 1973, the United Pentecostal Church did not believe in the ministry of saints. 1973, most of the UPC preachers and preachers of that day believed they should do all the praying for everybody. They believed that no one should be used in the gifts of the Spirit but them. Everything was to be done by them and through them. And so the revivals were so limited. We're getting at a place that we recognize that our wives are part of the ministry team. Now, if you want to be a 1920 child of God, and preach everything about women against them, 
Go ahead if you want to, but that's not biblical and it's not the day we live in. We need everybody in the house of God pulling this thing toward the rapture of the church. We need praise from the young people, praise from mom and dads, grandma and grandpa uh, need to fire up the wheelchair and take a lap in Jesus' name. And we need everybody obeying God. Am I right? Everybody obeying God and being used to God. Get that nonsense out of your mind. Uh, our, the wives of ministry in this day are great blessings and they have great ability and they have great power with God and they make great biscuits and tortillas and things of that nature and why would I ever condemn a biscuit maker? No way, Jose. So those are the seven battles that everyone must win. Tonight is such a key time in this revival and tonight's such a key time in your life that in a space of five minutes, somewhere God's going to give you a, such an anointed five minutes that it's going to change your life forever. It's going to change the way you see everything about the kingdom of God. It's going to set you free. It's going to re-anoint you and reappoint you into the realm of the supernatural tonight. For five minutes, there's going to be a supernatural breakthrough in this church that's going to set everybody where they're supposed to be. God's going to let you jump all the king's men, and, and you're going to put the enemy in check tonight. And God's going to restore things in your life so quick in five minutes. God's going to do some powerful, great things in this church. Get ready for it. The things that you've been battling, you're not going to battle them no more. The place where you're at, where you feel like you're defeated. Some of there's a few people here tonight that just barely hanging on, don't know they, they can make another month. You're going to go out of this place tonight full of the Holy Ghost and you're going to look for those spirits that's been trying to put you down and discourage you. God said, everybody in this house tonight that will let me, I'm going to anoint you and you're not going to be discouraged or despondent or oppressed no more. It's over. And you're going to walk in the joy of God like these pastors do every day and I do every day. You're going to walk in the joy of God every day in the middle of your greatest battles. You're going to enjoy it and give God praise. Now open the word of God with me tonight in this service. And 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse number 1. 1 Samuel 30 and verse number 1. It came to pass... When David and his men were come to Ziglag, on the third day, that the Amalekites, and these Amalekites were one of the chief enemies of Israel, church, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag and had smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire. I want you to get this in your mind. And this is not evangelistically speaking, the city had been burned to the ground. Everything they had produced, earned, stored up, everything that was about their future and their present tense, everything, every house, every belonging, every memory, everything was burned up, burned to the ground. If there is a picture of this scripture in your mind that you need to set, see a city completely burned, blackened, ashes. The wind creating little whirls of ashes going up in the air. The black soot on their sandals and their feet and their hands and their legs and in their nostril and in their mouth. No food. Nothing stored, no kids, no wives. While they were gone to battle the Amalekites, they had come in behind them. Now God told me tonight, I'm going to be the backup for everybody in this church. And the enemy is not sneaking up on anybody else and surprising anyone in this church tonight. God is going to be your re reward and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives and they were therein. 
They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. They took their family captive. The only thing that could have been worse was to see their black and burnt bodies laying in the ashes of Ziglag. But to think that they would be uh, turned into slaves, that their little kids would become servants, that their wives would have become prostitutes, that they would have labored all their life uh, in the camps of the Amalekites. They'd been tortured, beaten, made fun of. All the days of life, could, could you live with that if you knew that your child had been kidnapped and was sold into sex slavery? What would you think every day? How would you feel every day when you rise up? Think about your beautiful daughter had been caught away or your beautiful son who was uh, uh, turned into sexual uh, homosexuality and uh, their lives every day was being tortured and there was nothing you could do about it. I cannot think of anything that torments a child of God or a person anymore than to face circumstances that will not change. Breakthroughs that will not come. Healings that are promised but are never received. Words of God that are always on the outside but never penetrate and never get inside. Victories that are supposed to be won but are never won. God said tonight, I'm gonna to give you a breakthrough. I'm gonna flex my muscle. The arm of the Lord is gonna be revealed. I'm gonna show up tonight if you will show up, if you'll praise me, if you'll dig in tonight, if you'll make a decree unto me, God, I want victory and I want victory now and I'll do whatever you want me to do and I will not worship in lethargy. I will not live in Laodicea. I will not accept the Amalekite victory in my house, in my family, in my ministry. Come on, let's give Jesus some praise, everybody. Lift your hands to the Lord. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. Woo! Boy, I tell you what, the ones that were going to try to make it tonight, they missed, they're going to miss a great service tonight. God's going to set everything right. They're taking the women, the captives, take the women captives and, that were therein, and they slew not any. They carried them away and they went on their way. And so David and his men came to the city. And when they got there, it was burning with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Could you imagine your wife coming home one day and somebody stole her, burned your house down? Destroyed everything in your house, every photo, every memory, everything that you had obtained through a, a life of work. How would you feel about that? So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters. We must have revival. We must return to become revivalist in every service. Got to get this out of our mind that we can't have it every time we walk in. I'm tired of hearing pastors proclaim, well, we got to have teaching. We've taught ourselves to we're blind with teaching. We've ate so much of the table of God that we're fat and we can't move in the spirit and we can't do anything. We don't need any more burping. We don't need any more patting the backs of people. We need to get vigilant, on fire for God, full of the Holy Ghost, and tell our enemies what you have done, you'll never do again. I will not sit in the ashes of defeat. I will not accept the burning of my house and the captive of my family. I will not accept a generation that wants to disown God and shut down the Holy Ghost. 
Starting tonight, I'm going to get on fire for God. I'm going to let my voice rise up and pray and praise. I'm going to believe in the supernatural. You are the most dangerous weapon to the devil in 2019. This church, your praise, your worship, your faith in God. Oh, man, I feel the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to tell you who the devil fears more than anybody else. He fears these young men. He fears these young men, these young women in this church because they have strength and they have vigor and they have vision and they're bored. And God loves to get bored people and put them to work. Huh? My grandkids come over, Papa, we're bored. I said, I never said that to my grandma and grandpa. Well, you wasn't bored. I said, yes, I was. But I knew if I said I'm bored, I wouldn't be bored long after I started sweeping and cleaning and mowing and pulling weeds out of the garden. I never said I was bored. I said my grandmother, my grandpa, my mother, my dad never heard our generation say we was bored because if we did, we were put to work. So we never, we never owned up to it. No way, Jose. Not gonna do it. But God loves it when you are bored with life. I mean, how much joy is in a bottle of whiskey? How much fun is really in a needle? Honestly, how much fun is really in immorality when you have to hang your head down, when you see your kids, your wife? How, 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 how much greatness is it in a life what, what glory is it in a saint of God that no longer fights? That is no threat to the devil. If you're in this building and you've laid down your cross and you've laid down your sword and you are no danger to the devil, then it's a free for all. Any spirit, any demon, anything can come against your house. But I've learned that when you let the devil know you burn my house, you take my kids, you take my husband, you take my wife, you will find the wrath of the spirit of the power of a living God on the inside of me. I'll dance twice as much. I'll jump twice as is high, I worship with great intensity. We are raising up sissy lalas for God. We're raising up churches that don't know how to speak the faith of God and how to war in the spirit. Well, you wouldn't dare let someone break in your house and take something that belonged to you. I don't know about every other man in here, but you walk into my house and you want to take something. I live in Texas. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to say nothing else. I've got a little card behind my driver license. I don't let just anybody see it. If you want to uh, break into somebody's house or you want to uh, steal somebody's car, you better have armor on. Because it's a Wild West show going on out there. I'm telling you that right now. Just a, a couple of months ago, somebody went into a, a store to rob the store, and everybody in the store had guns. And all of a sudden, 15 people pulled out weapons and said, Get on the floor. And I want you to know, he got on the floor. I don't advocate that. I, I've got a permit. I don't carry it with me. Don't tell anybody that. I, 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 I was almost made to be ashamed not to have a permit to carry a concealed weapon. 
I'm sitting at a table in Texas preaching a couple years ago, and the pastor says, do you have a concealed weapon permit? I said, no, I don't. I don't want to go to hell. He said, you ain't going to hell carrying a gun. You only use it when you have to. I said, well, you don't want to use a gun. I don't want to shoot nobody. Well, if they want to do something to your wife, what would you do? Pray? I said, well, yes, I'm going to pray while I cock the gun. I'm a, yes, I'm going to pray that my aim will be straight. I'm not going to shoot them in the head. I might shoot them somewhere else. And because of that, I'm telling you, there are certain areas of Texas that crime is down low. I tell all my kids, don't get somebody who cuts you off or you accidentally cut somebody off and they want to pull you over. You don't stop. You don't argue. You don't, not in Texas. You don't, get on, go on down the road. It's no big deal. You pull down from you shouldn't have done it. Just wave, I'm sorry. But don't pull over and get out of your car. No, don't do that kind of stuff. That's almost anywhere. But I want you to know tonight, and I want you to believe me, that when the devil realizes he cannot break into your house without suffering, without coming against an immovable object, and he knows that he's going to get the wrath of God come down on him when he sees a church that will not have a dead service, that will not have a dead worship service, when he sees a church that doesn't wait for music or wait for the preacher to preach, and they come in with the power of the Holy Ghost. I was preaching in this church, and a country church, big church, but a country church. And I preached one night. I said, you don't have to take nothing off the devil. He's a liar. He's a good for nothing. I said, you use the power of the name of Jesus and the glory of God, and, and you have rights, and you, know, you don't sit down in the ashes of your defeat, and you get up off the ashes, and you get out of there, and, and, and you do something just like David's going to do in this verse. You don't let the devil come and do anything and rob and, and do anything in the spirit realm. You rise up in faith. And, and you do it. You find a way to believe God and to worship God. And I preached that night and this little lady goes home and she'd been getting beat up by her husband every night at church. He didn't want her to get home after 9.15. And the Holy Ghost would move and she'd come home late and she'd start coming to church with black eyes and everything. And I preached one night along those lines and she went home and, and, and her husband said, come on, get your whipping. Your, your, you know, he was an alcoholic. He was drunk and he slapped her around and said, tomorrow night you better be home before 9.15. And he, in a uh, drunken stupor, goes and lays in the bed. And, and she's in the kitchen bawling, squalling. She said, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Devil, I'm not going to let you beat up on me. And all of a sudden she looked down, saw a black skillet, walked in there and crowned him with that skillet and even had the audacity to say, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> All I could say is praise the Lord there wasn't a gun laying on the counter or a baseball bat. She said, I'll show you what cornbread can do. Huh? That's what a black skillet's good for in the South. Make some of the best yellow cornbread you've ever seen in your life. Put that old butter in there. It's melting on the side. Yeehaw! Come on, somebody. Cornbread. Mustard greens, turnip greens. Huh? Mexican people can't say nothing because you got some good nopales. I'm going to tell you right now, I, I done ate some good stuff. Don't ever buy that stuff at the store. It's horrible. Well, I don't want to get sidetracked. And so she goes, in Jesus' name, boing. That, that, that's a little exaggeration there. And, uh, Next morning he gets up, uh, wah, 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 and he was drunk and then that night and he goes, oh, I must have fell at the bar. No, you didn't. I must have fell coming up the steps of the porch. No, you didn't. I must have fell out of the bed last night. No, you didn't. Well, then woman, what did I do since it seemed like you know what I didn't do? You beat me up last night for the last time because I came home late from church and I got news for you, buddy. I'll be home tonight when I want to get home. I'm not out at a bar. I'm not drinking. 
I'm not having sex with my neighbors. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm going to church loving God and serving God, trying to raise my kids to know the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, well, you go to church tonight and come in late, you'll get another one. And he, she said, and you'll be drunk tonight and you'll go to sleep. And when you wake up tomorrow, you'll have another one look just like it on the other side of your head. And he said, I don't know what in the world has gotten into you. You just cannot go back to that revival anymore. It is driving you crazy. She said, no, it's driving me sane. Why would any woman get a beating for coming home at 9.15? That's serving God. So you do whatever you want to do, but you'll get another one tomorrow. And then you'll, she said this, and you'll look like your daddy the devil. <laughs> the second week of that revival, she stood up and testified about it. And I got up and I said, hey, sister, I didn't, that was not what I preached. That, wasn't it, that was not in my message. I'm talking about spiritual warfare. She told me after church that God gave me a revelation. Sometimes you have to use physical objects to do spiritual battle. I said, I, I, I ain't touching that. That's, that's between you and your God. But I'll tell you what happened. Next week, not that week, but the next week, the man walks in the door. I'd never met him before. Stood there and looked at her, bib overalls on. Looks at her a few minutes and walks down the altar. I mean, I'm preaching. It's not altar call time. And walks down there and falls in that altar and starts snotting and blowing snot everywhere and, and crying and, and rasping on the floor. And, and uh, some of the women, you know, you get to women, and some of the women jumped on him and started casting devils. I don't even know if he had a devil, but they started casting devils out of him and everything you could think of. They drug his carcass up to the baptistry and they put him in the baptistry. The women did. Don't you women know? There ain't nothing nobody can do with you in here. If you want to shout, ain't nothing we can do with you. If you want to dance, ain't nothing we can do with you. If you want to cast devils out, what are we going to do with you? We can't do anything. If we touch you, we go to jail. You can dance, you can jump, you can shout, you can praise, you can believe, you can have faith. And if nothing else, quit waiting on your husband. Get out there and let God have his way and let shame get him up off of his do nothing. I'm not letting, I'm not letting a woman out worship me. I can tell you that right now. Last Wednesday, on Wednesday night, if I'm home, I go to church like anybody else does. And Sister Wendell getting there and getting to worshiping. And, and I looked at her and I said, yeah, it's your church, huh? She said, yes, it is. It's my church. I said, I'm hardly here, right? She said, that's right. It's my church. I said, well, I got news for you, sis. You ain't out worshiping me. I said, get ready. I'm fixing to wind this toy up, and it's fixed to get loose. And I said, oh, come on, God. I can't pretend. Send the fire. If you don't, I'm going to get whooped down by a woman here right now. I said, come on, fire the Holy Ghost. And I mean, it showed up and the Holy Ghost got on me. And I started shouting and dancing and praising. And I looked over there and she was shouting and dancing and praising. And she cut out me. I cut out her. And my God, I mean, boy, the pastor said, man, you and Sister Winslow had one move of God tonight, didn't you? I said, who do you think won? He said, what? What do you mean won? I said, never mind. I said, I'll find out when I get in the car who won. <laughs> Folks, it's time to get up out of the ashes. It's time to say to God, the devil and everybody around, I'm going to use everything God's got. I'm getting a new attitude, a new anointing, a fresh breakthrough in my life. I'm going to start walking in the supernatural. I'm going to hold the hands of the man of God up. It's the last time he's ever having to preach by himself. I'm going to preach him to death. I'm going to preach him down. I'm going to say amen. I'm going to tell everybody I see and everybody I know about the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell my loved ones, you are getting saved. Say it and mean it. 
A few years ago, my sister called me on the phone and said, uh, Gordon said, Jimbo's not going to church anymore. I said, I know he's not. And uh, she said, well, he's got a motorcycle and he's riding in a motorcycle gang. I said, Jim? Yes, he's in a motorcycle gang. And, and he's, she said, he's doing drugs and selling drugs and, and uh, he's at a biker bar almost every night. I said, my brother Jim? Yeah, and I, I mean, you guys probably don't know this, or ever heard of this bike group called the Banditos, but it's a big southern motorcycle gang. And he's riding with the Banditos. And he's trying to become a member of it. I can't forget what they call it when you're, you're kind of on a little trial, you know, to see if you could get in. And so I, I said, well, I, in a few days, I'm going to be over that way. I'm going to go, I'm going to go see him. Went by his house. He wasn't there. Went to that biker bar that my sister told me about. There he was standing out front. Drinking out of a whiskey bottle. Smoking. Had the, all the paraphernalia on. And there was about four or five uh, banditos on the outside. There were some inside the bar. Bikes everywhere. And I'm just going to walk up to him. I'm just going to say, come here, brother. I'm going to talk to you. I'm your brother, and I'm going to talk to you. But by the time I, man, I just got to thinking, there's no way I'm letting my brother go to hell. He's been baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. He's not going to hell. I don't care what he's been going through. And he was going through some stuff, and it got him messed up. I said, it's not going to happen. By the time I'd work myself up, I mean, here's these banditos around him. I walk in, finally he looks and recognizes me and he gets this surprised look on his face. And I, I couldn't help it. All of a sudden, my hand, like, my, like Matt Dillon. <laughs> what? My hand just came out like out of a scalpel. And I stuck that finger on his chest. I said, in the name of Jesus, you're not going to hell with all these bikers. And boy, the astonished look got on his face. He told me afterwards, called me on the phone when I left. He said, oh my God, when you said that, I thought at the least what happened, they're going to drag you behind the bar and beat the living daylights out of you. That's the least what's going to happen to you. And I said on the phone when he called me, I said, they couldn't touch me. He said, that, I said, there was so much God all around that place because as soon as I brought my Holy Ghost pistol out, <laughs> one shot does it all. And stuck it on his chest, the fire. Look, God's going to back you up when you walk in faith. Oh, oh, I'm scared to say anything. As soon as you stand up and you stand up for God, you're going to feel the power of the Holy Ghost. And every devil and every demon in Tulare is going to know you cannot get away with anything with that church and you cannot get away with anything in that saint of God's life. They will not permit it. They will not allow it. And I said, I don't care what you think. And I'm not exaggerating. I don't care what you think or what you say. You're getting back in church and you're getting saved. And that's it. Leave these losers. Get back with the house of God. Got in my car. I even peeled out. Seriously. When you're in a four-cylinder, you know. But it peeled. Little rocks there. If it's on asphalt, you wouldn't even know what, you know. Little four cylinder Toyota. I showed them. I just throw that one rock like crazy out. That one rock went at least three or four feet. I showed them who the boss is. And I drove down that road and that phone rang. He said, oh my God, you're lucky, you're, you're lucky. I said, no, I'm not lucky. No, I, no, they couldn't touch me. I said, you know better. You know what God's all about. I said, you're getting saved. I'm not talking no more to you. You're getting saved. It's done. It's finished. Wait a minute, I got a choice. I said, no, you don't. I took your choice away. You say, that's not biblical. I don't care. If it was biblical or not that moment, I, I said it. I believed it. And 
five or six, seven days later, he has a motorcycle wreck. He's flying through the air. And while he's flying through the air, he's crying out for the mercy of God. He hits the ground, rolls over, and, and he says, God, if, if I can get up from this place and not, have, not be permanently damaged or whatever, I'm going to be in the house of God. That's it. I'm finished. I'm done. He kept his word. He left the emergency room, and, and he uh, called the preacher. He went to the church, prayed through, got the baptism of the Holy Ghost again, and is preaching the word of God right now. I'm not advocating frying pans. I'm not advocating uh, real pistols. But I'm telling you right now, you can't lose with the stuff that God's given you. You've got the faith. You've got the power. You've got the name of Jesus. You've got the glory of God. You've got the upper hand of, of the enemy. This city is ripe for the greatest revival it's ever seen. You need to tell the devil tonight, I'm not dying with sugar diabetes. You need to tell the devil, I'm not dying. My kidneys are not going to be diseased. My liver's not going to be diseased. My feet's going to get healed. You need to open your mouth up. Don't you wait for some old evangelist to call you out. You make a decree. I'm not sitting here in the ashes of my defeat. I am not sitting here anymore. I'm getting the Holy Ghost. I'm talking in tongues. I'm breaking out of this. In Jesus' name. You know, faith is, faith is not a feeling. Faith is not even an experience. Faith is a journey. We don't understand that. There are instantaneous miracles. But if you really looked at the gifts of the Spirit, you'd understand that a healing doesn't necessarily happen in a moment. A miracle does. You can ask for a miracle. If you don't get a miracle, believe for a healing. It's going to get better. I'm going to get better. I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk again. The pain's going to leave. Get up every day and declare it. I got healed one time. God made me get up every day and proclaim my healing. I didn't get it instantly. I, I was spoiled. I, I, you know, I, I just get everything real quick. And, and one thing didn't happen. I was like, oh, my whole world's falling apart and God's forsaken me. God said, shut up. I'm not forsaking you. Stretch your faith a little bit. Daniel went through the lion's den. I brought him through it. Now start declaring your healing. And so I did right then. I just did what God told me. I said, by the holy name of Jesus Christ, I'm healed. Sister Winslow said, you healed? I said, yeah. Yes, I'm healed. Good, take the garbage out. <laughs> I'm serious. I got this big garbage can and, you know, big tall thing. And, and, you know, I just had to have a big piece of property. So I'm dragging it down the driveway about a country mile. <laughs> And I'm struggling with it. And I come back in the house. She said, well, did you take, I saw her looking out through the curtain. She said, well, did you get it out there? You healed. I said, yeah, I'm healed. Glory to God. I said, I'm healed. But the third day, just like the resurrection, I said, Father, if I have to get up every day and declare it in Jesus' name and believe it, devil, you're a liar. I mean, the devil got tired of me jumping on him every morning. And God healed me and touched me. And I learned a lesson. That you have to be vigilant. You have to be on fire for God. You have to believe God. You'll get a job if you believe it. I remember I was, uh, I got saved and, and, uh, you know, I had to quit being an outlaw. I couldn't sell drugs and I couldn't cheat people. I I saw these chicks one night, uh, some parsley flakes for marijuana. Bunch of dumb chicks. They saw me like a month later. Want some more of that good stuff. I said, what the? I mean, I couldn't help it. It was so stupid. I I had to confess. You crazy chicks. It was parsley. Nothing's that pure. I mean, just as green as it can be. And they're lighting it up. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got a buzz. No, you don't. You dummy. There is no, there's nothing as pure as green as parsley. Look at parsley, you guys. 
you can't find, oh, that's, that's, after I walked away, they said, oh, look at that, that's real pure. No seed, no stem. Look how green it is. Hello? Put that in a salad. Don't smoke it. But you know what? When they told me that, I said, I got some more of that good stuff. I said, give me a minute. I went down to Safeway. Got a couple of bags, parsley. I said, now this stuff's going to cost you now. It's a, look how green it is. Huh? I couldn't do that no more, folks. And, and my wife said, you got a record, you'll never get a job. And you know what? God filled me with the Holy Ghost. And I went to this place to get a job. And, and the guy said, well, we're not hiring. I said, well, man, i got to have a job. I said, I'm, I'm a, I'll be the best worker you, you've got here. And nobody's going to out, outwork me. I mean, I just wouldn't leave. He said, you, you're not going to leave unless I hire you. I, I mean, I don't care what he said to me. He get mad. I said, I'm telling you right now, I, I'll work. I said, I don't care what you need done right here. I'm going to do it. I even throwed in, i got five kids. I said, man, with five kids, you think he's going to work? I said, I got an old lady at the house. Man, I can't go back without a job. That was a little, little bit of a lie there, but it was a possibility. It could, could have happened. And he hired me around the spot. I, I'm telling you, God's fixed to wake this place up. David says, watch this, and this is, this is it. We're coming to a place. We're fixing it. God's fixing to touch several people in this church, and God's going to give us a favor. He's going to anoint our lives, and we're going to start believing God for our families. Sunday night is going to be incredible. You bring some pictures of people. and or If you don't have pictures, bring it on your phone. If you don't have it on your phone, you write their names down, a piece of paper. You bring some anointing oil. Go down the store, buy olive oil. God will turn it into special oil. That's what the Bible talks about in the book of James. We're going to pray over that oil. Bring handkerchiefs, cloths, anything that God speaks to you to do. And don't, don't think that God can't do great things. God spoke to me one time and said to get five prayer cloths. And I have specialized prayer cloths that when I'm in my car, I have them with me. And, uh, and the Lord said, you're the five people we'll give these cloths to tonight. And so this one lady, and I told her, I said, come here, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to give you a cloth. I said, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for this cloth. I'm going to pray for you, and you go do what God tells you to do with this cloth. And so she had cancer. I said, you've got cancer, don't you? And she said, I do. I said, you got it. It's in your back, isn't it? She said, yeah, it's in my back. I said, is, there, is some of it wrapped around your spine area? She said, yes. And I said, well, you do what God tells you. I didn't tell her what to do with it. I just said, you, you do. I prayed. She went home. She knelt down by the bed, and, and the Lord spoke to her heart. And she laid it on the bed, on, on the sh- top of the sheet, and she laid down on that, slept on that cloth that night. And she woke up the next morning, throwed her feet over the bed, and all of a sudden she felt something different in her back. And she turned and looked, and there was her cancer dried up and dead, laying on that cloth. And that happened in Oklahoma. Come on. If it can happen in Oklahoma, it can happen anywhere. And you know what I'm talking about. So she comes to church that night, and she says, Brother Winslow, this is what happened. She tells me. She said, I want to show you this cancer. I said, oh, no, you're not. I'm not getting to McDonald's tonight and getting some nuggets, and all I can see is the cancer. You're not messing my spaghetti up. I get ready to eat spaghetti and all I can see is an old ugly cancer up in my spaghetti. I'm not eating a chicken fried steak and all I can think about is a dead old dried up cancer. I said, you wait till I'm not here and show everybody. But you're not showing it to me, girlfriend. I said, if it was me, I'd flush it in a commode and say good riddance. But she said, and my back is just a little pink in the area, but there's no indentions, there's no scarring, there's nothing there. Huh? God can do anything if you just have the faith, if you give God just a little bit of fight. Come on, surprise the devil. I'm talking to somebody. Surprise the devil. 
and say, I am not living in the ashes of my defeat anymore. I'm not living in my failures. I'm not living in my sins of yesterday. I'm not allowing my children to go to hell. I'm releasing this right now in Jesus' name. Everybody lift your hands. I'm releasing this right now. I'm releasing this message right now to everybody in this building. I'm releasing it to everybody. Everybody stand up. Everybody get your hands up. Start praying. I'm releasing this to everybody in this building right now in Jesus' name. Quick, 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 quick. Get your hands up. The anointed five minutes is about to hit this place. I'm talking to... 22 people that's been feeling like everything's passed you by. Your, your family's not living for God. You're not being blessed. But God said you're leaving the ashes. You're walking out of it right now. You're not going to live in the burned out house and the burned out dimension and the burned out spirit that you've been in the last few years and months. But I am bringing you out now. Quick. Run to this altar. Quick. Musicians, run up here to your instruments. Run, everybody. Don't walk. Run up here right now and throw your hands up here in Jesus' name and say, I'm leaving the ashes right now. Come on. Come on. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. You're not living in that anymore. Your feet are not going to be filled with the blackened ashes of defeat. Your nostrils are not going to breathe, breathe in the ashes of yesterday's battles. It's over. It's finished. It's done. You're walking on new ground. You're walking in a new dimension. Quit making problems for yourself. Keep, stop repeating the doubt. I'm blessed. I'm highly favored of God. I'm not perfect, but I've got the, somebody's fixing to let go. I'm telling you, somebody is going to let go of the ashes. Accept your forgiveness. Tell God, I'm not perfect, but I'm in love with you. I'm not perfect, but I'm called to do a work for you. I'm not perfect. Somebody's fixed to get the Holy Ghost. I feel it right now. I feel it right now. Somebody's fixed to pray through. We had several last night. People confessed it. Some came to me and told me the pain's gone. I'm healed. God's going to touch several people again tonight. Every service this week, people are going to get the Holy Ghost. People are going to give their heart to God. People are going to give in to baptism. People are going to get healed. It's just an absolute thing that happens. It's not some, oh my God, oh my God, this is crazy. It's what happens in the house of God. It's just what happens. There's no mystery to it. This man right here, I want to pray for this man in the pink shirt or light-colored shirt that's got the, got the cane. Come, come up here, brother, and stand right here in Jesus' name. If he could stand over there, he could stand right here. Come up here and stand right here, brother, in the name of Jesus. Everybody say blood, trans, blood transfusion. God's fixed to get my brother a blood transfusion right now. And God's fixing to touch sails in your body. I'm going to lay my hand on your head. God's going to touch you. God's going to touch the organs of your body right now. Well, we can look at your foot. We can look at your leg. And we can know there needs to be a miracle there. But God's showing me things in your body that he's going to touch and rejuvenate right now. The Lord said starting right now in this service is going to be a turnaround. You're not going to stay there in the ashes of a burned out past but God said I'm going to renew you. I'm going to restore you. I'm going to touch you. You're going to be a modern day miracle. Father in the name of Jesus let it happen quickly. Let it be a healing and a miracle for in the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ Christ touches your life in the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ heals you in Jesus' name.
fire yes come on shout 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 don't wait till the battle's over shout now don't wait till the walls come down shout now God's people shout before the walls fall Hallelujah. Can I pray for this? Uh, pray for this lady right here. Can come stand. Can bring someone with you. Yeah. Uh, bring, yeah, bring somebody with you. There's somebody else supposed to come up here and stand with you. There's somebody else is supposed to come stand up here with you. I see another one. That's not her. Who is it supposed to come up here and stand by this woman right now? In Jesus' name. Get up here right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm not knocking you, sister. Uh, not knocking you out of the blessing. Yeah, come, come stand up close to the front as you can right now in Jesus' name. How many believe God can heal this group right here? God said to tell you, God said to tell you, if there's anybody in your family that's incarcerated in prison, get ready, there's a great miracle about to happen. God's about to release a, 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 God said they're not going to live in that. Let, let, me, let me finish this real quick. I got, God just reminded me. The Bible said, David said, as he sat there in the ashes, as he sat there and his men were crying. I'm talking about men that had cut heads off and saw arms cut off and, and blood splattered all over them in battles. While they had went out after the Amalekites, the Amalekites came in back and burned Ziglag. And David did something. When he came back to that burned out village that he had, should have done before. And the Bible said David looks and his men start crying and travailing and they're falling down in their homes where they were living. And they could not find the burned. I really believe this. I really believe that they'd rather have their children's bodies burned than to think of them being in slavery with the Amalekites. Sexual slavery, physical slavery, abuse. And all of a sudden the Bible said that they even turned to David and they were just blaming David and they were just so upset and so cry everyone was crying. And all of a sudden God gave David a breakthrough. A breakthrough that would not leave him in the ashes of his defeat in his past. And he says, tell Abiathar to come. And to bring the ephod. And so Abiathar shows up and he's got the ephod with the 12 stones. And those stones actually represented the promises of God for Israel. There were 12 promises that God had given them eternally for the rest of their existence. That there would be 12 prophetic blessings that would sustain them and keep them and bring them through every trial, every situation. And what David did was he said, I should have reminded myself that I cannot go by myself. That it doesn't matter the 600 men that I've got. But what matters is what God has spoken to me. It means more than what I see or what I feel or what I hear. And so Abiathar comes and there are the 12 stones each one with a prophetic word on it. And each one of them had a letter there that had even had letters. And when the high priest would go and put the sacrifice on the altar, it, it, it is told us that those, there were letters in those stones that would show up and the Lord would spell things Words would appear through the glowing of letters. And those letters would show up inside those stones and God would spell out a message. And David reached inside the ephod and in that vest that had the stones on it and there were two great big stones in there. 
And Israel would pull those out when they were in desperation and needed a word from God. And when they brought those stones out and held them in their hands and they would say whatever it was they're asking God. And the Bible says, David said, shall I go? Shall we pursue after the enemy? And will you be with us? Will we have a supernaturalness about our battle? And the stones begin to glow and they begin to vibrate and shake. And the Bible said that Abiathar, the prophetic word came out and said, you'll not lose anything. You'll get everything back. You'll get your wife back. You'll get your children back. They had taken their food with them. You'll get everything back that the enemy has stole from you. And the Bible said David screamed every man to his animal. Some on horses, some on camels, some on mules, donkeys. And they begin to go after the Amalekites. And something happened you'll never see anywhere else in the Bible. That when they went to battle, not one man died, not one son or daughter was lost, no wives were killed. You cannot have battles with swords and children and wives in the midst of it that some of the Amalekites would not have thrust through their families as they were trying to escape. But not one was lost. Can you wrap your mind around what God's saying? I don't believe once saved, always saved, but I believe once you're saved, you can be saved the rest of your life. I believe God can keep you. And I'm telling you, young people, God wants to make a covenant with you. There are, there are four ways in the Bible to make a covenant with God. And one of the ways is an offering. And if you would study offerings in the Bible, you would find that every time a man of God gave an offering, he also asked God for something in return. And God made a covenant with him. God made a covenant with Abraham. And Abraham made a financial covenant with, if you young people make a financial covenant with God right now, and keep that covenant, he'll take you places the rest of your life. You'll be, look, look, since the last time I was here, the Lord spoke to me and told me, uh, he said, you're going to pray for somebody in the next few months and they're going to become a millionaire. And I said, uh, I said, uh, wow, man, Lord, I, just let it be me. And the Lord said, no, not you. Because I got you where I want you. You need ever offering. So you, you're motivated. So no, you're, you're not going to become a millionaire and sit at the house and go fishing. And just preach for your friends. No, that ain't happening. No recreation preaching around here. And so I called this lady out in McLeod, McLeod, Texas. I called her out and I started praying for several things she needed. And then all of a sudden I saw it and I said, oh my God, really? I looked at this woman. I said, do you have a job? She said, no, I don't. Do you own your house? She said, no, I don't. I looked at her. I said, isn't that just like God? She said, what? I don't have a job? I don't have a house? I said, just like God, to pick the person out that doesn't have a job and doesn't have a home that's going to become a millionaire. You could have heard her pin drop. Like, what? This lady? Pastor called me a few weeks ago. Brother Winslow, when can you come back and preach? And at first I didn't get it, but I mean, 30 seconds, I went, wait a minute. Is that sister a millionaire? Yes, she is. She is a multi-millionaire. When can you come? I said, Pastor, you're bad. You're a bad boy. I know what you want. He said, well, it doesn't say it's wrong to have faith and believe. I'm telling you, God's going to bless you. Young people, you make a covenant with your God. Make a financial covenant. Make a covenant with God in your heart. Say to yourself, young people, if I falter, if I fail, if I come up short, I won't stay there. Are y'all hearing me, young people? I don't care what happens in your life. I don't care what sin overtakes you. Do not sit there in the ashes. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, over half of these people in this, half of you in this church are being affected by sins that God's already forgiven, washed, got rid of, and they're not even there anymore. And you ought to be dancing higher and jumping higher than anybody else in this building. 
because of what God has forgiven you. All right, let's pray for these miracles of healings right now. Of course, I, I can't guess, and I, who, I don't even want to guess. That's no fun. I mean, you know, why would I want to guess? Why would I try to? I don't have anything to show off or be. But if God was to reveal to me and show me, it helps my faith. It, it helps me be more specific about what I pray for. Specific prayers get more results than anything else. And so I believe God wants to heal these three ladies right here. We're going to pray for them, all three of them. And, uh, and once again, I know it's uh, not too late. And, but, you know, if you, you're not going to make me mad. I've got to do what I've got to do, right? Don't you believe the man of God should do what he's supposed to do? And we just prayed, and believe it or not, God interacted with all of us, and we just left Ziglag, and we are, we are under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and we're going to go forward, and God's going to do some great things. But God said he's going to touch uh, people that's incarcerated. If I was to tell you three ladies, it's more than just one person. One individual that's supposed to get a miracle from God about incarceration and trouble with the law. And uh, if I was to tell you that God wants to do some great things, would would y'all believe this right now, that God's going to do some great things for your family? Pardon? No, don't tell me. Just be quiet for a second and let me amaze you. Let me amaze you, okay? Okay, then tell yourself, hallelujah. And let me amaze you, hallelujah, because God's amazing me. You can tell me later after church. Okay, if you could catch me. Let, let's, get, let, let's get ready to pray. When I get through preaching, look, all the pores of my body are wide open, and I've got wet, a wet shirt on, and I'm soaking wet, and I just, I've got to try to keep my voice fresh. And if I try to take care of myself, my, I can scream all I want to. I'm going to pray for this brother right here. There's something over the top of your head, brother. God just showed me there's an anointing over you. Come up here. Come up. Yeah, come up here and stand up here and get ready. You're next. Just wait right there. You, you give me permission to do whatever God wants me to do? Huh? Amen. You sure? Amen. You won't get mad at me? Okay, somebody get me a pair of scissors and just wait on the Lord. You're not getting a haircut. Somebody find me a pair of scissors and get them up here to me in just a minute. He told me I could do it. And so I'm going to do what the Lord showed me to do, and I'm going to give you a prophetic word from God. It's going to come to pass for you, okay? Because you got a lot of things that's it's not sin or anything, but it's, there's things going on behind you, and God's going to do some things behind you tonight. Behind the scenes, God's going to do something. Let me get over here. Lift your hands up right now. Pastor, get someone. No, I don't want you to have to do it. But get somebody to put some oil on these sisters. God's fixing to touch this lady. You've got a healing in your body God's going to give you. You've got something that's in your body that's not going to be there in five minutes. It's fixing to disappear and be gone. God's showing me dark spots in your body, and I'm going to lay hands on you. They're going to leave in Jesus' name. There's something down in the lower part of your abdomen. Something's happened down there, and God said, get ready. I'm going to replace some parts in your body that's going to help you be healed and to help you not fight depression. When I touch your head, you'll overcome everything you've been through. God said, I'll never let an enemy ever touch your, touch your, uh, your faith ever again. You're going home with such a praise and rejoicing in your life. A glow is going to be on your face. People are going to start asking you what's going on. Father, in the name of Jesus, I command the healing in her body to take place. I command her to get back every dollar the devil has stole from her. In Jesus. Oh, be thou healed by the power of the living God, by the blood of Jesus. Oh, there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. Hula Masaya Mohorandaba. God, give our sister new eyes. Give her new eyelids. Give her new corneas. Heal the optic nerve. Stop the leakage of blood in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Be healed. Lift your hands. Lift them up high. Uh, Who came to church with this sister? 
Who's a friend of this? Oh, they are? They're out. They're, they're not doing you no good. They can't do you no good. They're out. Lift your hands. Give me a couple of sisters. Stand behind her. Just put your hand on her so she knows that somebody's praying with her. Father, in the name of Jesus, it's over. It's done. It's finished. The attack on her body is over. God said he's touching your body. You have swelling in your body. You have fluid retention in your body. You, you, you have attacks on your chest and your heart. And God's healing you of it right now. God said, I'm touching your blood pressure in the name of Jesus right now. I'm touching the attack against your house. No witchcraft will work against you anymore. God is breaking the black, dark witchcraft spirit that's coming against your body and your mind. You are free. Your house is free in Jesus name loose be healed take your coat off take your coat off brother now you said I could do whatever the Lord tells me right okay praise God I may promise you won't tell anybody what I'm fixing to do turn around turn around face that way that's a pair of scissors I want to show you what they gave me to operate on. I'm going to butcher you. Put some oil on this right now. Okay, turn around. Put, put some oil on that right now. God said, I just cut your shirt tail off. God said, every time you have a need, you just put that shirt on and walk around with it, lift your hands to God because God said, I'm anointing your past. I'm anointing everything about your family that the enemy's been sneaking up on your family and attacking your family. God said, no enemy shall come in by surprise against you ever again. God said, my angels are standing behind you. My angels are grabbing your shirt tail. God said, my blessings are chasing you. My blessings are grabbing your shirt tail right now. Come on, give the Lord the praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord the praise. Can I pray for you? Lift your hands. I just felt the Lord I just felt the Lord surge in this place right now. I just felt a Holy Ghost surge. I know we're used to this. I'm around this every night that I preach, but it, I, it's never common. It's not ordinary to me. It blows my mind. Lift your hands. God's fixing to heal you right now. I'm going to lay my hand on your head. God's going to heal you. God said, I'm touching your family right now. Everything that's happened in the past with your family that's left the family knocked down and devastated and they, they smile, but they've been through a living hell. And God said, I'm going to go right now and visit Ziglag. I'm going to go there right now. And I'm going to, you're going to get back everything the enemy has stole from you. You're not going to live in a burned out house or a burned out life. God said, I'm healing your body right now. I'm giving you double of the Holy Ghost when I lay my hand on your head. God said, I'm putting a hedge of protection around your house, your loved ones, and any siblings that you have. God said, it's over. The attack is over. It's finished. It's done in Jesus' name. Lift your hands up. God's healing your body. Lord, in Jesus' name, I command it. There it is, right there, in the name of Jesus. Go ahead, Holy Ghost, speak. I will not accept anything but the prophetic promise of God. I will not accept. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. It's done. Hallelujah. Lift your, lift your hands right now. Let's pray right now. Father, now you've done some of the miracle, but you haven't done all of it, and it needs to all be done right now in Jesus' name. I see the prophetic word over your head, and you've received some of the things that you're waiting on the rest of it to come to pass. 
especially in your walking and in the stiffness and the tightness of your joints and the back that needs a, uh, needs a healing in your spine. And the Lord said to tell you, you're a good woman, you got a good heart, but you've been through some living hell. You've had some burned out places in your life and you've tried to shake them off and you tried to break free and God said, this is the night. The man of God preached, you will not live in that burned out place. You're leaving the ashes of your past behind. Behold, everything becomes new in Jesus' name. The Lord said, for, when I pray for you, I'm supposed to pray for somebody whose name is uh, Gene. I'm supposed to pray for a Gene. And so somewhere in your future, you're going to come in contact with somebody by the name of Gene. And when you do, you're going to know that's the person that the prophetic word said, as I'm touching you, I'm going to touch them. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I want you to touch every marital situation around this woman. I want you to touch everyone that's had problems with their children. Lord, that they've been lied on, left behind, brokenhearted. God said, you shall not operate with a broken heart anymore. In the name of Jesus. Yeah. Let it go now. You're whole. You're healed. You're whole. I command that inflammation out of your body now. I command it back to the pits of hell. Hallelujah. Praise God. Can I pray for you, sister? Yeah, c come up here. Hallelujah. You're, you're actually, you was actually supposed to come right in behind these ladies right here. Lift your hands up. But I couldn't, I don't know, I couldn't put my finger on what I was supposed to do. And I was trying to find it. God was moving so quickly. Lift your hands. God's fixed to touch you. Now, there is something in your health that needs a miracle from God. God's going to give it to you. You're struggling with several things in your physical being. God's going to touch you. There's some inherited sicknesses in your body God's going to touch. And uh, there's, this, um, there's this brand new anointing of the Holy Ghost coming on your family. Someone having some real problems in their relationship. And you're interceding, praying for them. God said, I'm going to touch them tonight in Jesus' name. No more gastric problem. No more digestive problem. No more acid problem in your stomach. God's healing it right now in the name of Jesus. God's touching your body. Every joint in your body is getting a touch from the Lord right now. God said, I'm opening up the revelation of the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost. I'm showing you the power of my name starting tonight. I'm going to show you revelations in the Word of God that you're going to know is real and true. Father, right now, this woman has faith. She loves you. She believes in you. I want you to touch her right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus. There it is. There's that blood flow. Go ahead. Just talk in tongues. Let the Holy Ghost do what it wants to do. There's no will but God's will tonight. Jesus. Name. Hallelujah. All right, everybody. Everybody join hands tonight with somebody around here in the name of Jesus. And, and uh, Pastor Tom, come up here right now. Pastor Tom, bring your girlfriend with you right there. And uh, come up here right now and just stand in the name of Jesus and lift your hands to the Lord right now. I'm not going to. I'm not going to reveal anything tonight. Nothing bad. It's all good. This is a man of God. He loves God. And his only heartbeat of his wife and him is just to win souls. And I'm telling you, this, this couple's a soul. These are soul winners. And they use everything God's given them, every weapon, every talent, every calling from God. And uh, I'm going to tell you, God said to tell you, you're not going back to any ashes, no burned out cities for you. You're stepping into the prophetic word of God that came to you when you got saved. God said, I'm not letting one dream go idle. I'm shifting the gear right now into high gear for you. I'm going to make even your enemies be at peace with you. You asked the other night, Brother Winslow, I want to get into the faith of God. I want to walk in the faith of God more. I've walked in a little bit. I've seen the gifts operate, and I want to get into it more. God said, you're going to take that leap of faith tonight. 
God's going to sow a greater seed of the supernatural in your life. Lord, in the name of God said, even your wife is going to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus. And yes, God will give you power over many nations. Yes, the finances will come in. I will be your organization. I'll be your banker. I'll be your counselor. I'll be your reward. I'll be the general of your army. In Jesus' name. 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 name. Come on. Okay. Let's. Let's uh, join hands with somebody around this church right now, Jesus' name. And as we're getting hands, I want to pray for this young man right here. Come up here, brother. Come here and just stand on this first step. Everybody get a hand, hold a hand of somebody. I know, if, I know if your men are holding hands with another man, you don't want to do it very long. C- come over here. Because every time a preacher would tell me, grab somebody's hand and be a man, I'd say, Lord, they got five minutes. I'm not holding no man's hand over five minutes. I'm out of here. You can call me homophobe or anything. I don't care. I don't even want to hold a woman's hand if it's not my wife's. But I'll do it for five minutes. Lift your hands up right now. We're going to pray for you. God's fixed to touch you. God said, it's not your imagination. It's me. I'm knocking on your heart's door. I've been knocking on that door for 102 days. And you're going to open that door and you're going to say yes to me and I'm going to start moving in your life. You're going to get an understanding of the Word of God when I touch your head. You're going to open the Bible up. You're going to start understanding the Word of God. God's going to give you a photostatic memory that you can memorize things in the Word of God. You're going to hear my voice walk in the supernatural. And from this night forward, saith the Lord, I will give you a spirit of obedience. And you will obey me every time in Jesus' name. That's the Holy Ghost anointing. Lord, I'll do it. It's done. All right, grab that hand. Lift it up right now in the name of Jesus. And give God one minute of a shout. A praise, raise your voice, let the devil know I am going to follow God. I'm going to walk in the supernatural. Come on, lay your hand on that person next to you right now. Hallelujah. Lay your hand on them. Speak a word over them. We're coming out of this. We're not staying here. We're moving forward. There's a turnaround. Hallelujah. Come on, speak it by the power and the authority that is in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hashataya Korayata
Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings unto the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow. Become a servant of righteousness. Keep self pure. Be an example. Have faith in God. Follow Jesus. Put first things first. Resist temptation. Be faithful and be fruitful. <laughs>